Welcome to the You Go First podcast. This is the place where we bring together thought leaders, business pioneers, personal development gurus, and just about any person we discover that will inspire and compel you to go first in all areas of your life. Please welcome keynote speaker, philanthropist, and the official head dream chaser for Odyssey Teams, Inc., our host, Lane Hensley. want to welcome everybody today to another episode of You Go First. So we're talking about how to bring people together that inspire or educate or help move people to go first in their lives in one way or another. A lot of people sit back and want other people to go first. And this is about creating a place where they can find that inspiration or that information that in inspires them to go first wherever that is in their personal lives in their work lives and in their communities so we are very blessed today to have with us an international speaker a mind reader if you will and he'll maybe tell us more about that is uh, has a show on the bbc travels maybe 125 or 150 programs a year somewhere in the world inspiring and moving people to higher levels of maybe awareness and behavior so please if you're out there be thankful that you're going to get to hear from the mr david mead today yeah we've in out in the office there you go. All right. Thank you for having me. This is so. This is exciting. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, we're uh, we're tipping off. We're super excited that you're here. And really, our theme. Some of our themes. One of our themes is around people are wowed with things, and they immediately go to how. And maybe some of that childlike excitement goes away and they just mechanize the thing. And so I think you spend a lot of your time creating wow for people and then giving them a path to be better. So let's just start off with like what what makes you go wow? What inspires you to keep doing what you're doing? It really you know, stops your heart, stops your mind. I, I think today in 2019 or whenever you might be listening to this there are fewer and fewer surprises in the world as every year goes by it's really difficult to surprise an individual really shock them and really move them by doing something that they couldn't have expected now as as a, I, I'm a principally a keynote speaker who uses mentalism as part of the metaphor as part of the the, the analogy for why I do what I do, it's, it's the vehicle for me to communicate messages. And mentalism is built on surprise. So I understand the psychological shape of creating that moment of, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming. And in our business, we work incredibly hard to surprise everyone. We surprise people who inquire about me doing a talk and for one reason or another, it doesn't convert. They get a surprise from us afterwards because we want them to feel that electricity. So even if, even if the piece of work hasn't converted, if we know if we can surprise them, even when they think it hasn't worked out, then they're going to think of us first. In, a, in my keynotes, I try to surprise people by Typical keynotes these days are, are information transmission and they tend to be maybe not terribly entertaining, not terribly interactive and not terribly, in some cases, useful. They don't, they don't have really clear takeaway. So I make sure we've got loads of that. And then, you know, we, I, I like to use moments and experiences of surprise when it comes to reading people's minds because they should... Here's the hard part about my type of job. When I do my theater tour, it's two and a half hours mm -hmm. and it is two and a half hours of you think of something, I tell you what it is. You think of something, I tell you what it is. You think of something, I tell you what it is. And about 45 minutes in, people think, I think he's going to know what this thing is. So yeah. you have to create surprise and texture by creating some jeopardy, making it look like it's not working. And for me, that's the alchemy. I think surprise is the, is the key ingredient in great relationships, great commercial relationships and great experiences yeah well i mean we do you know so maybe you could tell them a little about what you do at odyssey you know we do our experiential and team building programs and all of our leadership stuff and when our two organizations have come together now and then full disclosure we i just got to enjoy a 90 minute session that you did with our team and uh, I was definitely in wow mode. I've, of course, watched you and admired you for a long time, but to get to see you actually doing this live with my team, guessing these crazy numbers and uh, behaviors, I mean, there's these predictabilities in human behavior. And if we're really out making wow and transformations happen, but we're so predictable, how do we find an off-ramp to change behavior? How do you create those off-ramps? And maybe tell our listeners a little about your company and how you create those, those uh, predictable 
patterns, but then how do you inspire people to then change a pattern to, if, if we're so easy for you to read? I, I just, I'm, I'm blown away. Well, I, I think that today, every time we engage with a person, an individual or an organization, our default expectation is to be sold to is that they're gonna try and flog us this car or this program or this book or this retreat, whatever it might be, this hotel room. Uh, I think the minute that you stop selling and start thinking, start seeing them as human beings who want to know things, want to learn things and want to be part of something and want to be liked and treated like a human being. I think that in and of itself is is surprising. One thing that, that, that has created, helped us create a surprise that's helped us grow our business is making sure that we build humanity into everything that we do. Mm -hmm. So we're, we are we are an events business and um, we do hundreds of events all over the world. And what we have found is that as we've gotten bigger, the personal connection between me and my team and our customers has started to shrink because we're so busy doing so much that we've had to automate and institutionalize um, and have systems that allow us to keep on top of what we're doing. But that has removed the personal connection in some areas. So for the last two years, we have fought, fought to build personalization into every single thing that we do. So for instance, that means the minute that someone gets an inquiry through my website and they've, they say that, oh, maybe we want you to do a keynote or maybe we want you to do the wonderful Helping Hands program, instantly within a couple of minutes within three four minutes they get a personalized video from me and it's not an off-the-shelf video it's one that wow. is direct to you and i say hey Lane, thank you so much for getting in touch uh, i really appreciate you thinking of me for your event i'm traveling at the moment but my team in the office are looking at the diary they're going to be back to you within the hour and they'll let you know whether we can deliver this for you but either way we it means the world that you would think of us now the reason that that this has been so special is that when this video arrives in their inbox, they think that this is a standard video that gets sent to everyone that fills out the contact, bo contact box. When they watch it and hear me saying their name, talk about their event and their industry, they're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he took the time to do that. Yeah. And the truth is, it's a tiny amount of time that creates an exponential impact in, in our relationship. Because I travel so much, I'm not always able to do that human one-to-one -one bit with, with everyone that, that gets in touch. But this is a way of breaking that down. And it also creates that moment of surprise where they just think, first of all, how did he do that so quickly? Second of all, is he really doing this for everyone? And if you think that they have sent an email or uh, a request out to four or five event businesses or four or five keynote speakers, I can guarantee none of them are doing this. Yeah. So they feel like they know me. And your business and my business is built on that human bit. That It's more than Velcro. It's, 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 an, it's an, an intrinsic joining of two individuals uh, or two organizations who culturally or from a DNA point of view should fit together. And this is a way that's allowed us to break that down. So let's look at the other side. Uh, sometimes we know straight away that I'm not available for that event and, uh, and that none of my team are, are available either. So if that gets to a closed lost, we send that person a gift instantaneously in the post. Wow. So they receive a personalized gift with a handwritten card and we, we, we sign the gift. And now remember, they've inquired and maybe the cost has been too high. Maybe it hasn't worked in the diary. Maybe, I, maybe I'm already working with a competitor in a, in a very public way, so it's not a good idea for me to, uh, to to work with them as well. And I'm always really honest about that. For them to get this present in the post for a contract that didn't even proceed, it means that we are top of mind the next time that they're about to do anything. So this, this personalization, this human connection is something that we work really hard to authentically systemize so that a person doesn't feel like they're being processed. I think that is, I honestly think that is part of, of the, the secret sauce that makes our business grow so fast and, and do so well. And truthfully, it's driven by my team. They are the best team in the world. I love them so much. If any yeah. of them leave, I'm going to follow them home <laughs> because um, they're the ones who really make, make the magic happen. But for me, just to go back to your original question, that, that, that human connection in a corporate world is really rare at the minute. And mm -hmm. if you can crack that, I think that, that the world's your oyster. Yeah, well, my mind's reeling on uh, kind of where to go next. And no doubt we have a lot to learn from you when it comes to marketing and just how you've grown your business and how you've taken mentalism and your skill set 
to the BBC and your TV shows and to your speaking and and your philanthropy. I know you've traveled to India before and putting those prosthetic hands on that you've been a part of building. And before we really talk about maybe that and how personal that project is to you, in the spirit of You Go First, which is our, our, uh, our name of our podcast here, this who went first for you? Like who went first to inspire you? Who was that mentor for you? Who is that mentalist or where you get your inspiration? Who went first in your world? Do you know, it's a, it's a good question. I remember when I was maybe 15, 16, 17, there was a mentalist in the UK called Darren Brown that is not terribly well known over here in the US, but uh, I remember watching what he did and he used really simple things to blow people away. And for years I had been thinking, mentalism is the perfect analogy, vehicle, mechanism to talk about the challenges and opportunities that businesses face. But I just hadn't seen anyone else do it and I wasn't convinced that it could work. I saw him use mentalism to talk about things like relationships and emotion and love and fear and all of these intrinsic human emotions and I suddenly realized well they're all business emotions as well so I can use this as a, as a mechanism to talk about and a metaphor to talk about those areas so the so he inspired me and showed me through the media because I had seen his shows that actually this is like a plain piece of toast that you can put anything on top of mm -hmm. as long as you give real thought to it so that it's authentic and it's not just superficial and I remember the first thing that I came up with myself is in my TED talk on YouTube and it's a really simple little jigsaw puzzle it's a wooden puzzle that's got a wooden frame that fits millimeter perfect around it and when you take the frame off you reorganize it and you keep adding pieces to the puzzle again and again and I use this to talk about achieving more with the resources that we already have to reimagine the challenges that we have mm -hmm. so we can we can rise above whatever those issues might be and what makes it really work is you keep putting the wooden frame back over. Everything still fits. You're not removing any pieces. You keep putting more in. So I use that to talk about motivation, about mindset, about thinking about how we can achieve so much more than the sum of our individual parts. And when I did that, I suddenly realized this is it. This is what I was supposed to do. This is what I was born to do. I know that sounds a really cheesy thing, but I genuinely feel like what I'm doing today is what what I'm here for. This is yeah. my purpose. Well, I definitely, I understand that feeling, you know, as I'm sitting here talking to you today, it's just like all these little moments in our lives and these weird moments where we feel like we're way off course. And then one day we wake up and go, I'm exactly on course and all of those struggles and all those life challenges that come our way. And, uh, I watched your Ted talk. I loved it. And I've seen a lot of your stuff that's on YouTube and so forth. I encourage our listeners to to get out there and Google search you and see all the great content that's out there. And I think today, this is an opportunity to really get behind the scenes of what makes you tick, what inspires you. I know we've been brought together in our love of philanthropy and how we're mixing these philanthropic endeavors, particularly with the helping hands where we're putting prosthetic hands on people around the world. And uh, that's why I'm so thankful that you have found us and we've found you. So. Maybe tell our listeners a little about uh, not just, yes, we're building prosthetic hands in our programs. We're both doing that as partners. Uh, but what does that hand mean to you? What has it meant to you to travel around the world, putting hands on people and uh, just how you're connecting that to business and personal? Yeah. So for years, we've been looking for ways to do something different in our business that had an impact beyond what we're deliver delivering inside the room. And it just shows you how these things happen. Years ago, maybe three years ago, I was working for a client of mine in Arizona, Saba, and I almost wasn't available for that event. I remember so clearly that the diary was so conflicted, but we made it work anyway. And I got to see your team deliver the bike building program. And I remember the emotional connection that I felt the moment that the big reveal occurred as, as part of that activity. And I, I just sensed that this was really, really different. I had never seen anything that had this mm -hmm. impact on people. This isn't, this isn't a training impact. This isn't a human impact. This is so much bigger than that. And I started to research your business and then I saw about this prosthetic hand program. And to take it all the way back, I've got two kids and my youngest, George, when he was born, he had one seizure on day one and two seizures on day two. And then he had three and six and 12. And as George got older, his needs just got more and more complex. 
at this time, we were working really hard to build a business. We were putting everything on the line to, to, to make it work. And I had a, a burgeoning successful TV career, but it was still early days. I, I certainly wasn't a household name in my country. And, and this happened. And we had no idea what George's condition was. We had no idea what his prognosis was. And frankly, even today, we don't have a diagnosis for George. We have no idea w- w- well. what his real clinical condition is. But it was so, it was so hard for us to try and think beyond that moment Mm, that, that it was just, I remember sitting in the hospital and one minute my wife and I would just be desperate with uncertainty. And then the next minute we would be laughing our head off mm. because that's just our style. We always find opportunities to lar- laugh in, 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 in the dark times. The, the, the toughest part of that journey I remember was that he was having all of these seizures and no one had ever used a word to describe what the seizures were. And we very foolishly didn't think maybe that it was epilepsy. Uh, it turns out that that is definitely one of his conditions, but not his overall condition whatever that might be it's syndromic and a doctor came in and the the doctor was obviously hurried and obviously under pressure and obviously had lots of patients to see and she had given us a quick update on George's condition and he was really deteriorating they weren't able to control his breathing they weren't able to control his seizures and they just had no idea what the situation was and as she was leaving in a hurry I asked her I said sorry can I ask so is is this epilepsy or is epilepsy one of his things or I remember she said she tutted and said of course it's epilepsy and then she left oh. the room and we just we lost it wow. I, we just because we'd never heard this word mentioned before all we knew were that that it was seizures and I remember mm. at the time thinking that 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 the doctor didn't mean to be do- so dismissive because she was obviously under pressure. But I really appreciated the power of just taking time with people mm-hmm. and just listening and just embracing silence sometimes and shutting down that hurriedness. And as George got older, it's uh, his, his needs just got bigger. He he started to lose the ability to open his eyes. Hmm. And the way the ocular surgeon described it to us is that your uh, optical pathways, whatever they may be, they're a bit like a motorway or a freeway. And if cars are driving on it all the time, it works great. But if cars aren't driving on it all the time, it gets mossy, weeds grow. And eventually through time, this will not be a road anymore. It'll not be able to function as a road. And the optic nerves are exactly the same. Because his eyelids were drooping to the point where they were basically closed all the time, it meant that he wasn't, he was eventually going to absolutely certainly lose his sight. And we had to take this, we, on, on advice obviously, we had to take this really tough decision to permanently remove his eyelids. And we really struggled with this for a long time because we thought, what is that sensation going to be like? He can't talk and he can't walk. He won't be able to tell us, are his eyes in pain? Are they dry? Are they uncomfortable? And I'll just, I'll never forget the the day that he came back from the theater with with no eyelids. And I remember thinking, this is just, this, this poor kid is just going to have a terrible time. He's just... But as every day went by and as, as we ran towards those difficult decisions, Every day got better. Every single day got better. Mm. And he is the happiest human being that I know today. He is, you know, he, 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 he never has to worry about paying a bill. He never has to worry about who to vote for. He never has to worry <laughs> about um, taxing or insuring his car. He just, he, he giggles and laughs and smiles through every moment. And the weirdest things will, will tickle him. If you take like a, his shoe and drop it on a wooden floor, this is like he's won the lottery, <laughs> the reaction that he gets. And we, we've always tried to find a way to honor the fact that we just feel so lucky that George was born with us, where he was in the world and when he was. Because our, our zip code, our postcode, defines your direction in life in many ways. Not mm-hmm. always, but in many ways. And I, we just know if he was born anywhere else in the world, he wouldn't have lived a single day, not a single day. This is just, 
it's so obvious and clear to us how lucky we are and for us the prosthetic hand program helping hands allows us to feel like we're doing something to help someone who is exactly like George who we haven't even met and there is just something so special that happens in the room as you do it and I remember the first time I reached out to you guys to do it I remember thinking they're going to say no they have no interest in this weirdo from Ireland doing it (laughs) And it's been the most important partnership we've had in our business in this short period of time. And to attend the clinics and to meet and talk to these young people. I remember at one clinic, there was the oldest person that got a hand was 92 years of age. But he told us he was in his late 60s. Because, and we think he told us that because he thought that, well, if I tell you I'm in my 90s, you'll not give me a hand because I'm yeah. too old. And it's just... And we've, we've fitted them on to one young girl, I remember, who was um, the exact same age as my daughter. And I just get so moved when I think about the lives that these people are all living now in the time since we fitted these wonderful hands on to them. And in a few days, I go to a new clinic again in, in Alwar in India in just a few days. And it's just this, there's just something. Because these aren't toys. These are real clinical devices that allow people to wash themselves, clothe themselves, brush their hair, drive a car, kids drive a scooter, teachers write on blackboards. What on, what, why yeah. on, if you can do this, why on earth would you do anything else in the world? Well, what a what a, what an answer to the question. Uh, I'm lucky to have my business partner, Bill John, in the studio today, and he delivered that bike program that you participated in and has also been to India Fitting Hands. And you know, you're, if people have seen you present or seen your, your videos, you're really, you're funny, funny guy and just organic and present with people. And then uh, we appreciate you sharing some of the hard times. And I think, I think most speakers, most people that are out there working hard for people have those moments in their lives where they, they struggle. It's hard, um, wherever that is for them, whether that's, you know, my sister lost her son or my cancer or wherever people are struggling. It's like, Somehow life, I think everybody has those struggles, but somehow I appreciate you have the courage to, you know, get yourself on an airplane and stand in front of groups of people and and be organic and be present with them and and read their minds or predict their behaviors and really share with us how predictable we are. And at the same time, uh, recognize that we can change and we can be inspired and we can be better. Um, And we are so thankful at Odyssey that you found this hand program. We certainly uh, stand ready to support you however we can to get more hands out there in the world. And uh, as your family gets older, uh, you know, the needs that you may have, we're we're always ready to support you in those things. Um, Maybe maybe as we close here, you know, in all of the content that you deliver, are there three things or two things or five things that you think if people thought of more often, uh, they could improve the quality of their survival, uh, no matter no matter where their struggle is or no matter where their hopes and dreams are. For me, I when I look back on all of the things that I've learned, I, I, I think the, the one thing that I live my life by is that the lens through which we look at the world every once in a while needs demisted, needs defogged, needs cleaned up because we we're, everyone has their own stuff. And one of the best examples of this that I saw, I watched it on a plane just a few days ago, the movie Eighth Grade. Um, mm. Has anyone seen it? Oh mm. my gosh, this movie is phenomenal. Wow. And it's not, it's, not the, it's not the story of the character in the movie, it's your story. Mm-hmm. And if you're listening to this now, it's your story too. This, is, this was your eighth grade, I promise you. I can't imagine a human being that this doesn't apply to. And it just shows that the people who we think are strong and confident and have it all together, they absolutely do not. Mm-hmm. It's all of us. We're, we're all just muddling through and trying to do our best. So when I look at uh, mindset, for me, I, I live by this yes and approach. And I try to run towards challenges as much as possible. I find that saying yes to the stuff that scares you, that intimidates you. And, and that's what my whole business and career is built on. Almost every time that I've delivered a brand new program, the first time that I delivered it, I, I, I have somehow <laughs> sold it with no experience. <laughs> And 
must is a good master and it forces you to make sure that it's outstanding so that they want to use it again and again and again. When I first got my TV show, I got it because I managed to convince people that, oh, I'm absolutely the right person mm -hmm. to make this TV show, even though internally my internal monologue is telling me, what on earth are you doing? This is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. But I run towards it with a yes approach and it allows me to, to not, not hide that fear, but to use it to, to frighten me to work harder. Um, so taking a yes and approach goes to the heart of everything that we do as a business and, and, and as a team. I also think that, that we have to set scary, ambitious goals for us because we live up to and down to our expectations of ourselves. And our job is to set that bigger so that even if we, even if we fall short of that, it's bigger than we, we, we would have gone to. Yeah. So here, here's a good example. We were, as a team, really inspired this year by the anniversaries around space travel and uh, space exploration. I remember thinking, when, when you look at a really short period of time, 50 to 70 years from the first plane getting airborne to, to suddenly being on the moon, what, what an Amazing. improbable. And I think about the amount of failure that must have happened to, to build into that success. So we tried to come up with, well, look, what do we do that is a good, strong analogy for that? What is our Apollo mission, for instance. And so we, we've turned it into a, a program that we're just piloting and experimenting, uh, experimenting at the minute, and it's called Shoot for the Stars. And it involves your team coming together to do something, build something, make something, and we literally send it into space. So not metaphorically, it goes to 45,000 feet. We have three GoPros mm -hmm. and GPS trackers on it. And when it comes down, they have to find it. And when they find it, we take all of the footage, put it together, and they see this thing that they've created go stellar you see the curvature of the earth wow. you see the moon and the sun uh, and the reason we like it is that again it's built on surprise like the prosthetic hand program they have no idea what they're going to do and so here one client has got it to write out their mission vision and values and so they come up with this during a big exercise and we send their mission vision and values up into space and the analogy is so strong because i say this morning you would never have dreamed that it would have been possible, never mind doable, to send something in actually into orbit, into space. Well, these mission, vision, and values that you all say you're gonna live by, they've already been in space. They've mm. already done something <laughs> impossible. Now, all you need to do is live those mission, vision, and values. And that came from that yes and approach. That came from setting big, stupid ambitions, inspired by movies and books and 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 we never would have thought this was possible, but we're doing it now. We're, we're piloting it, we've ran it a, a few times now. And we love it and it, it it but it was also truly inspired by the work that you do because I, even if i had seen um or, or had the idea of of a program like helping hands i don't think i would have been able to operationalize it to systemize it to make it into the into the the thing that it is today and it's a movement today it's more than a program yeah. it's far more than a program and i i think that shoot for the stars is is kind of a version of our of us doing that, having stupid ambitions that are improbable and impossible, but just running towards it because why not? Because if we don't do it, some, someone else might. And, and then the other, I mean, the other thing for, for me, I just feel so passionate about my team, about making sure that they feel loved and cared for and invested in because they are the best team in the world. I, I, mm. I honestly think that our team and Odyssey have been cut from the bark of the same tree and I just wish we could drop everything. Let's all move to the middle. Let's go, where, where, where's the middle? In the ocean? Let's all open an office in the <laughs> middle of the ocean. It'll be floating, we can get BP to fund yeah. it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I just, so those, those are what I live by, running towards challenges with this yes and approach, setting stupid ambitions, knowing that if we fall slightly short of that, it's still bigger than the mediocre ambition that we might have had. And then just making sure that that I never lose this wonderful team that I have that allow us to do um, impossible things. Yeah, well, thank you so much, David. And uh, if you're out there and you've never seen David present, I really think you ought to or uh, experienced David, as I would say, because we really got to experience the authenticity of you in our team and you absolutely are practicing what you preach in every cell in your body and it's evident. Uh, you know, the old uh, people won't remember what you say, but how you make them feel. And uh, we definitely feel like we are one of, we're very similar in our passions about trying to change people's experience and impact people's experience at the same time, like you say, run toward our own fears. And part of that is happening right now with just putting this podcast out there and having a chance to talk with you about uh, what makes you tick and what inspires you. And 
We're just thankful that you have partnered with us and we've been able to partner with you. Uh, we're, I want to thank you. I am the president of the Ellen for Prosthetic Hand Foundation, and our vision is for sure to get 100,000 hands out there on the planet. And we could never do that without people like you catching the vision of what happens in the program, as well as what happens after the program to change lives that really are struggling to see hope. And I'm sure that when they see your face and you're there putting a hand on somebody that they have really, truly stared hope in the eyes. So well, you. look, it's a great honor to join you on the podcast. I'll come back anytime. All right. It's only about 7,000 miles from where you live. So maybe we'll have to catch I've had you. worse commutes. <laughs> Don't worry. We, if I can send something into space, I can get to Chico. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, on that note, on behalf of everybody at Odyssey Teams and at You Go First podcast, we are so thankful to have the uh, the amazing David Mead with us right now today. So if you're out there, please check out David Mead. Find him. We will put the website and all the links we can on that when we post edit. All right. So thank you very much. A round of applause in studio. All right, David Mead. Thank you. We want to thank Mr. David Mead again for joining us today on You Go First. You can learn more about him. He's a keynote speaker and mentalist. He's on his website at David Mead. Dot co dot uk. You can catch his show on the BBC One. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at David Mead Live. And like his Facebook page, David Mead Mind Reader. Remember, Mead is M E A D E. And we are so thankful again to David Mead for joining us on You Go First. Thanks for listening to another episode of You Go First. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to listen to other episodes, you can find us at yougofirst.live or you can see more about our host, Lane Hensley, on his Instagram at OneDreamChaser. To learn more about his company, Odyssey Teams, Inc., go to odysseyteams.com or follow all their social media channels at Odyssey Teams. Thanks again, and we hope you will go first to share our podcast with a friend or colleague. Now, you go first.